From therapeutic massage to talking circles and tribal doctors, Alaska is on the forefront of traditional medicine with a growing number of programs that incorporate Alaska Native healing techniques with modern medicine. And joining us now to talk about this blend of old and new, Dr. Allison Keller. Now you've worked at South Central Foundation with tribal doctors and you're also an MD. So you've been able to see the best of both worlds and maybe we could start talking about tribal doctors. You know, what kind of practitioners are they? Well, tribal doctors have a variety of different skills and training. So each of us practice differently and have um, unique skills. We're trained as apprentices with master uh, traditional healers who are experienced Alaska natives. And um, what we focus on is mostly hands-on healing and plants. But historically, we did different things such as midwifery or um, surgery as well. So let's talk about some of the tribal doctors that are well known in Alaska. Della Keats, the late Della Keats up in, in the Kotzebue region. Now tell us a little bit about why she gained such fame and being able to help people heal pain. Well, Della Keats had such a tremendous following because her treatments were very effective. And so what she did is she took her traditional ways and then also learned Western medicine and worked with Western doctors to help hone and improve her skills. So she taught many people. She taught physicians and she taught um, people in her family. So I've learned from her nephew, Stephen Booth, how to do uh, different kinds of body work, especially for treating uh, migraines and body pain. Now you have uh, native heritage, so, so you're familiar with some of this. Yes, I'm Koyukon Athabaskan. My mother's family is from Nulato on the Middle Yukon. And so since I was a young child, I was identified as a healer in our community. So started by walking on backs and then became really interested in plants as food and medicine and using that as a modality for healing. So Rita Blumenstein, we have to talk about Rita because she was someone who was identified as a young person. In fact, was brought in to deliver babies is what she told me. She's Yupik. Tell us about your experience working with Rita. I've been really blessed to spend time with Rita uh, throughout my life. So she calls herself our family doctor because she's taking care of four generations of my family. She also teaches a lot about plant medicine. So she, um, she's especially knowledgeable also about hands-on healing and using energy to help people heal, which is a very subtle, low-risk treatment. Della, Rita Blumenstein, they use these techniques. And for some people, that would just be a little bit woo-woo to say that you, know, you can touch somebody and know what's going on inside of them, know that a baby is turned the wrong way. Well, traditional healers are masters of physical exam. So we learn how to feel what's under the skin. And also, the body is a complex system that includes energy. And the energy doesn't stop just on the skin surface. So in Western medicine, we'll use heart and um, brain tracings, EKGs and EEGs, to look for the energy tracings. What's wonderful about science now is that it can prove that the energy in our bodies doesn't necessarily stop, but continues for about 10 to 15 feet in all directions. So traditional healers have been trained to use that kind of energy to help soothe and heal. And we're trained in something called healing touch as well, which is an internationally standardized type of medicine that can help people in hospitals or in clinic settings or just in the community to help feel better from pain or anxiety, depression, loss, and lots of other things. So let's talk about the plants themselves because you, you brought some and you were also a speaker at this conference in Kenai and you talked specifically about treating diabetes with medicinal plants. So what are some of the ones here that you would recommend well, for diabetes in particular, the plants that I find helpful are blueberry, dandelion, and chaga. So blueberry is a very safe plant to use, um, although if you're on diabetes medicine, you should monitor your blood sugars and talk with your provider about your plan to start blueberries. 
There are different kinds of extracts, but traditionally what we would use is a tea. So we would either boil um, the plant stems and the leaves, or we could also um, just make a cold infusion of the berries. And so that can be uh, drunk once or twice a day as a treatment for diabetes. And then the dandelion root, when you're working with a root, it tends to need to be uh, boiled a little bit. So I would boil that for 10 minutes with uh, a lid on it and then drink a half of a cup a couple of times a day. Dandelion also has a constituent called inulin in it and so... Inulin, it sounds like insulin almost. It does sound similar but inulin is different than insulin and inulin promotes healthy bacteria growth in the gut and um, it also has kind of a sweet flavor. So you can roast the dandelion roots to make them a little bit more sweet. And it's a perfect time to harvest dandelion root right now. You wanna be careful where you harvest plants because plants take toxins from the environment into their own body. So in other words, maybe not by the side of the road or, or mm -hmm. an industrial site. I actually grow dandelion in my garden because then I know that it hasn't been toxified. <laughs> We spend so much time trying to get rid of them and you're growing. It's really wonderful. They say that globally you can sell it for um, a pretty penny because it's people know that it's worth something medicinally. And then uh, chaga is a plant um, that also can be pretty safe uh, for making a tea out of, but you also want to monitor your blood sugars. Now chaga is what, a, a fungus of some kind or, or a mushroom? It is. It's a... It is a medicinal mushroom that grows on birch trees and it takes quite a while for these um, to grow. So we want to be careful to not over harvest. And what I've been taught is to harvest approximately a third of the chaga growth to allow it to continue to propagate. And also I'm told that chaga needs to be boiled to get the medicine out of it because it has thick cell walls. Cut them up in the small so this chaga you know, is, is a substance that gets more and more uh, publicity about its cancer healing properties, that it, it actually fights cancer. At this conference in Kenai, there were several people that said they could see a difference in patients that used it, that they were actually able to beat cancer. This kind of makes me skeptical, you know, because we're all looking for those miracle cures. You know, the thing about plants is they have many constituents in them, often hundreds of them, and so they're interacting with our bodies in really complex ways. What I would say about chaga is that it has many different properties. It's antibacterial, it's helpful for high blood pressure, it's antiviral, it's also anti-tumor. And what I think is important is that we're using Western medicine to the best of its ability, but also complementing that with our traditional ways. And uh, with chaga, it is extremely anti-tumoral. We found that uh, in studies, it has benefit for tumor, for inhibiting tumor growth. But I would encourage us to partner with our providers so you can have an individualized plan that creates the best potential for your your healthiest outcome. For your recovery. Well, the problem with chaga we're hearing is that it's become a sensation all over the world and, and people are looking at Alaska because apparently we have some of the most potent chaga that exists. Mm -hmm. You so, worry about it being exploited. I do worry about things being exploited very much and chaga, devil's club, rhodiola, and many other local plants are vulnerable to over harvesting. So, what I think about chaga is that we should consciously harvest it and use our guidelines that um, our elders have taught us and also be conscious that the ability for chaga to absorb toxins or um, oxidative stress is really high on the chart. So it's one of the highest potency medicines for scavenging free radicals and helping against aging and other disease processes. So I think understanding that and appreciating it is important, but also using it as a medicine in a respectful way. That's the balance. Now, one of the things at this conference that was interesting is there were ceremonies associated with picking these plants, and, and that was talked about. Absolutely. So I was taught to treat plants as a relative. And so I really have an individualized relationship with the plants. And that um, 
and that helps me with the medicine. So when I'm harvesting plants, I'm actually praying with the plants and then I'm gifting them. So um, often that could be a song or traditionally it was something like tobacco, sometimes a bead or a piece of hair. So the plants that I've harvested here have all been through that experience. Well, let's talk about a few more of them. Uh, right in front of me, we have the stinkweed, and it's got some other names, and you pick its chythluk, and doctors there have said that it has some antibiotic properties naturally. So it's, it's good for many things, but boy, it sure smells nice. I don't know why they call it stinkweed. It's such a silly name, isn't it? It's very aromatic, so you can smell it, and it was used as a fumigant, so a lot of folks will use it to boil it or burn plants like this. Its relative is sage, so that we detoxify a space. So it's antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, but also we think the smoke is a spiritual cleansing, and so that's really helpful to know about. Uh, Chithluk or stinkweed artemisia species are, um, are medicines for colds and flu, but also some people have used them for cancer treatments. What I find helpful in regards to cancer also is sometimes separating the traditional medicines from the um, Western medicines so that we can give each of them their own time and respect and space to work. Um, so with stinkweed, you can make a tea, and what I've been taught is to make a tea out of the older plants that are above the snow. And so the wintertime brown leaves are what we use generally for tea. It's helpful for pain, and so I make a medicinal ointment out of the chaga and just um, use an olive oil or oh, another you mean, oil you mean base. the chai -thluk. I'm sorry, the chai -thluk, of course, <laughs> the stinkweed. Stinkweed. Now you have uh, something also that smells very good, yarrow? So this is yarrow. It's also known as millifoil or Achillea millifolium, and um, yarrow is a, a wonderful spring, and fall and winter plant. So it's helpful for flus and cold. You can just take the flowers and use them as a tea. But also I was taught to use the leaves in case you have an injury. So you can just macerate the leaves a little bit and, um, and then use that on an injury if you like had a cut. one. Mm -hmm. Cuts, rashes, but especially it's helpful for an acute injury. So if you had bleeding, Yara is really well known for stopping the bleeding because it has vitamin K constituents. So one of the things we hear about these Alaska plants is that they're more potent because of our climate or, and also probably less uh, vulnerable to pollution. Do you see that we have an industry? I absolutely do see that we have an industry. I think that... Um, we could be conscious about how to develop that in order to not over harvest and perhaps produce some regulations and guidelines for people who are harvesting. But I feel like Alaskan plants have a terrific opportunity to help us heal our chronic diseases and the diseases that we see more in the modern setting. So we're just about out of time. You have a, a business that you're launching. Quickly tell us about that. Snow Creek Medicine is a new business that offers consultation teaching and then also will offer plant medicines. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Allison Keller. Okay.